Let me take you back in time for a few moments. The year is 1991, and my wife and I are on our way to a destination 8,000 miles away, to a place that's about as close as it gets to the origins of humankind. The country is called Botswana, home to the world's largest population of African elephants. Of the 415,000 remaining African elephants, 130,000 of them still call Botswana their home. After an arduous 32-hour journey, my wife and I, my wife and I are at our elephant blind, sitting high above the ground, and the orange sky is making its way towards its usual wake-up call. After several minutes in this beautiful silence, I recognize that the air is heavy with sage, which never leaves you and will always connect you to the continent of Africa. But after a few moments, we hear a sudden crack, and there's branches breaking and bushes being pushed aside, and then she appears. Whew. An awe-inspiring matriarch walks right in front of us towards the watering hole, and if, right behind her was a herd of gorgeous elephants munching along the way. And if this wasn't special enough, you could see some tiny little babies wandering along with their yet-to-be-mastered trunks and unknowingly just looking so gosh darn cute. <laughs> my, my, my wife and I just, we sat there and we watched this in awed silence. I mean, we just, we just couldn't do anything, you just sit there with our mouths open. But then, perhaps out of curiosity, or, or maybe, maybe just to welcome us, this beautiful matriarch walks towards us, about 10 feet away, about eyeball level, and she stops and stares and looks deeply into our eyes. At that moment, my entire world stopped. Never before had I ever been so transfixed. And I have to tell you, what happened next was as difficult to explain as it was profound for us. You see, my wife and I had been trying to get pregnant for the prior three years without success. We just couldn't imagine a life without having children. But in that moment, this wise matriarch said to us with her wise eyes, it's okay to move on. And somehow, without speaking to each other, my wife and I felt this message. We looked at each other with tears in our eyes, and we knew that an inexplicable shift had just occurred. We realized that our lives could be meaningful and rich, even without children. And this brought us a profound sense of peace, which we carry in our hearts to this day. This is what I've come to know as the baptism of Africa, because in that moment, we had trans transfixed ourselves to a new chapter in our lives. We've never questioned the epiphany that this beautiful matriarch gifted us on that day. Subsequent trips to Africa have further deepened my visceral understanding of how brief and how precious our time here really is. So today, I would like to share with you three lessons, but also three questions, in hopes that the African elephant will speak to you as powerfully as they have spoken to me. Lessons that I believe they've instinctually known for one and a half million years. Lesson number one, the lesson of quiet. Think about it for a second. The African elephant spends its entire day wrapped in the arms of Mother Nature's quiet embrace. Hmm. That's not something that we're used to, is it? So being here requires an entire adjustment to your sensory system and invites you to leave your familiar self at home and, and open yourself up to the wisdom of African quiet. But being here is not that quiet always, particularly at night. Thousands of reed frogs serenading you to sleep. The comical grunt and snort of an elephant. Excuse me, that's a, that's a hippo. <laughs> oh. And there's the, there's the wayward elephant finding its way through the night. But hearing those sounds can not only put a smile on your face, but it can also, it can also scare the heck out of you. 
So like I said, being here does require a shift from the familiar to the foreign. And the familiar for me, and perhaps for all of us here, is the everyday noise of modern life. It's just so pre prevalent that it seems like we've stopped hearing it. But our brains don't. Research tells us that our daily diet of disquiet does exact a toll on us, making us more agitated, restless, even emotionally disturbed when there's too much noise. Beneath this starlit sky, uncompromised by light pollution, in this symphony of quiet, I'm reminded that I am not alone. The thick, black, African night with its beautiful sounds that are almost quiet invites me to a new relationship with life which for the moment is uninformed by sight and almost totally informed by quiet. But believe it or not, this kind of quiet is available to all of us here even in our busyness without having to travel 32 hours. For example, simply lying under a tree and looking up at the sky or bathing yourself in any sunrise or sunset as the world makes its wonderful motion from light to dark and back again, or re-imprinting your heart with the sight of your child asleep in pure innocence, or simply melting into the tenderness of someone that you love. While none of us can escape the daily toll of that daily noise, we can mitigate what it does to us and how often. So what, would it, what if we all embraced the readily available gift of quiet? Lesson number two, joyful connection. <laughs> the, the African elephant has one of the largest, most closely knit relational networks of any animal on earth. This is mostly due to the fact that we have a matriarch. The matriarch is the trusted and confident guide of the herd and is almost always the oldest female. She is responsible for everything and she is in charge, from the daily routines to the inevitable and sometimes dangerous long dry journeys in search of scarce watering holes and food supplies. She is also an expert at what we call secure attachment. In humans, securely attached children feel connected and protected by the presence of their trusted caregivers. More often than not, securely attached children turn into well-adjusted adults and are less likely to suffer from physical and emotional illnesses. Another connection that the African elephant has and a cause for that connection is the fact that their cerebellum is a little bit larger than most animals, proportionately speaking. And so this makes sense to me because these animals show empathy and compassion to just about every species there is. They don't enact revenge. They don't kill their own species. You just don't see those kinds of behaviors in wild African elephants. So how is it that such wild animals can behave so civilized? And how is it that what we call civilization can seem to be at times so carelessly wild? Much, if not most, of all of our societal issues, I would argue, around the globe, is deeply rooted in the fact that somewhere along the line, we didn't have enough or we have lost our secure attachments in our lives. But another connection that is really important and critical for the African elephant is joy. But make no mistake about it, the African elephant does live in a constant state of awareness underscored by fear and for good reason. Their impeccable memories most likely remember and know that the combination of human-animal conflict, natural causes, as well as horrific poaching has plummeted in their numbers by 95% since 1900. 10 million African elephants in 1900. Now we have 415,000 left. But even in the darkness and the tall shadow of these numbers, African elephants always make time for joy, regularly. Like, like rustling with their trunks or 
putting grass on their heads or sitting on each other or trumpeting in the wind, who knows? They do all kinds of things to bring joy to their daily lives. Another, another example of the kind of joy that they bring to their lives is what oftentimes starts as a simple drink of water turns into what I call the, the original organized chaos. The mud bath. Massive bodies enjoy a ritual that is both fun and practical. I mean, how can you not envy this joy? <laughs> uh, and oh, by the way, if you're interested, the Ritz-Carlton does offer a mud bath for $400. <laughs> We're not that different, are we? <laughs> so when you think about your own connections and, and, and how much joy you have on any given day, what comes up for you? A missing conversation? I'm too busy waiting for somebody else to make the first move. What would it take to be more connected like the African elephant? Lesson number three, do no harm. The African elephant is a member of a very exclusive club called Keystone Species. Otherwise known as ecosystem engineers, they play a critical role in the biodiversity, creating a kind of glue for Africa's vast and complex ecosystem. Nature's engineers, they shape and they replenish the world in many different ways. One of the ways is that they, with their tusks, dig up dry, crusted riverbeds during the dry seasons, which coincidentally used to be populated by termite mounds. And they create huge watering holes for all animals to drink. And some of these watering holes last for a hundred years. Another example is elephant dung. Their 220 pounds of rich green dung is full of nutrients and minerals that keeps thousands and thousands of plants and other animals alive. It also gives the opportunity for the male and female dung beetle to play their important environmental role. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, now, some of you might have already guessed that somehow we humans have figured out a way to uh, capitalize on this elephant dung. For example, did you know that there is such a thing as dung tea and dung beer and dung gin? There's even uh, high-end coffee beans made from dung that uh, sell for as much as $500 a pound. Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks hasn't yet started selling this. <laughs> yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> here is a group of village women who have managed to create a very successful business by making beautiful art paper out of elephant dung. They, in turn, have inspired and encouraged so many other people in their village. African elephants, when they traverse the savanna, create huge, huge pathways while eating on trees and shrubs, almost acting like a land plow. And believe it or not, in water, African elephants actually make highways for humans and highways for hippos, so they can navigate the pristine waters of the Okavango Delta. Much, if not most, of what the African elephant does to its environment actually makes the environment better for others, by comparison. We humans have been around for 377,000 years, and we have managed to create a potentially irreversible impact on our planet. While African elephants don't know fully the, com the possibility of the doomsday that lies ahead environmentally, I believe that they know with all of their hearts how important every blade of grass is, every mud hole, and every tree is for their survival. What would it take for us to have such awareness and to act on it? In closing, I would like to say that it is impossible to watch the African elephant without being humbled. I mean, deeply, deeply humbled by the gentle generosity of their behavior, how they teach one another, how they care for one another, how they have fun together, and how they naturally steward our earth. My biggest, deepest, heartfelt learning from the African elephant is this. If we are to evolve as a species, 
particularly now with the tensions of climate change and political divide and social injustice, we must make a big shift to a very simple place that the African elephant has known for one and a half million years and has never lost. As neuropsychiatrist Dan Siegel says, the shift that we have to make is a focus on, from going from a focus on me to a focus on we. He says it's not that we forget the self, but we have to increase our awareness of self to include others and all of us. And maybe if we can internalize this lesson, if we can find our own baptism of Africa, then maybe we'll have a shot to make it to one and a half million years. And if we learn this lesson really well, let us hope that the African elephant is right here with us. Thank you.